was born like we had an issue with the internet there for a few minutes so yeah taking off a little late but hey we're here and we're gonna do this so let me turn this down just a minute it is the 17th monday the 18th for those of you across the pond and beyond good morning good afternoon and good evening to you and thanks for joining me here on your paradox media's late night in the rockies and seriously we've got some leprechauns in the wire but hopefully things go smoothly from here on out let's keep our fingers toes hairs and eyes crossed that it does yeah security tape full of hats hold on tight hold on loosely if you're listening live, you may be listening to us on We Are Paradox Media under Spreaker. You can also listen to us um, anywhere you listen to your podcasts. If you'd like to join us live, we are live on YouTube, as well as Spreaker, Facebook under We Are Paradox Media, and Twitch under We Are Paradox Media. And hopefully you guys aren't drinking that green beer. That stuff is nasty. It's not good. Don't do it. All right, so you know what the drill is. Today it's story time with me, Tessa TNT, and we're going to be reading Miss Kathy Reich's book, Thrones to Ashes. And we're pretty close to the end on this one. If we do finish, I have um, a book which I'm really excited about. So yeah, let me get my notepad over there. But from the Dream Time. So this is an Australian book about. Australian Aboriginal legends, and um, yeah, I found this at the Durango Library on the free rack, and I was super excited to pick that up, and I haven't read it yet. I'm going to wait till we're all together to do that. I see where we left off. So Harry, in her scrapbook, had Lisa Card's reference to moccasins, her water tissue, lost her rock. The window bar imagery was undoubtedly thrown in by my ID to portray frustration. You know, I'm pretty sure that's supposed to say idea, but it just says ID. Weird. But my mother's appearance puzzled me. And why the reference to a hospital and sickness? And who was the old woman? I watched the other cars pass, wondering how so many could be on the road so early. Were the drivers going to jobs, delivering kids to early morning swim practice, returning home after a long night, serving boigas and fries? Ryan pulled into a lot outside the prison's main entrance, parked, and leaned sideways against the door. Sunday, and had to work double. Evangeline and Oveline were yanked back to track a deal when Lorette got sick. You've always known that. The girls started coming to the island in 1966, and the first summer after the Tracadie Lazaretto closed. Could be there was another hospital in Tracadie. I don't think so. I'll check time at a cannery at a motel. Association with Ruined. That was decades ago. As Hippo says, the Acadian memory goes long and deep. The Landrys weren't educated people. Maybe they chose to hide her away. Maybe they distrust a government like Bastrak. Ryan made one of his non-committal sounds. Maybe Lorette was frightened of being quarantined in some lazaretto. Maybe she was determined to die at home and begged her family to keep Jackety often meant a business was still talking for an Ryan waited until the Mercedes had merged into traffic, then followed. Chapter 36 Guys, I'm so sorry about my voice. Um, we had influenza over a month ago, and I've just been dealing with residuals, and um, my voice is one of those. So, thanks for hanging out. Ryan and I drove in silence. Rush hour was pumping, and I feared that taking my eyes from the Mercedes might allow our quarry to become lost in sea. The sea of bumpers and satellites flowing south toward the city. Ryan sensed my nervousness. Relax, he said. I won't lose them. Maybe we should follow closer. They might spot us. We're in an unmarked car. Ryan almost grinned. This crate screams cop louder than a light and sound show. Poor shifted into gear and drove off. Bazier, just don't. 
The Mercedes made one more turn, then pulled over on the boulevard in La Bernouf. Ryan continued past them, slid to the curb, half blocked down. I watched the inside mirror while Ryan used the rear view. Frank Gore placed something on the dashboard, then she and Bostarot got out, crossed the sidewalk, and entered a gray stone building. Probably going to her office, I said. She stuck some sort of parking pass in the windshield, Ryan said. If this is her office, she must have a loser. I've thought of that. He looked, root, root, and the light flashed. Yanking the door, he threw himself behind the wheel and lurched into traffic. When the Mercedes passed us, Ryan let several cars go by, then followed. Bostarock wound through surface streets onto pointing a remote at the Mercedes. The car turned left, a lane of blacktop that skimmed the far shore. Out my window, the water glistened, blue-gray in the early morning sun. Traffic was light now, forcing Ryan to widen the gap between us and the Mercedes. Past the hamlet of St. Jean, Bastarot hooked to right and disappeared from view. Then, Ryan rounded the corner. Bastarot was on to Chemin Royale. Bungalow, but it died ten yards to the right. Ryan drove to that end, made a 180, and killed the engine. Now what? The river road continued to the left toward Chemise. Reaching into the glove compartment, Ryan withdrew a funny pack. A fanny pack? Oh my gosh. Totally 80s. I know its contents cuffs, lipster clips, baggage, and a Glock 9mm. Ryan used the thing when not wearing a jacket. Yankee free, his shirt tells Ryan stepped to the back with a pack on his belly and checked the string that would kind of undo the zipper. Then he cranked the engine to Royale, leaving behind a ripple of dust. You? Silence then. You must wait until later. A burst of adrenaline coursed through me. Though muffled, the voice was familiar. Pretty sure it was Obeline, who everybody thought had committed a sewer slide, but really did not. Code 6, no backup needed. <laughs> Give me a burger and step on it. We want to ask you some questions. The woman didn't reply. Ryan hit the bell again and again. Go away. Police, Ryan called out. There was a moment of she'll return soon. He will be angry if he finds you here. We thought you were dead. I was heartbroken. So was Harry. Please leave. I'm fine. Tell me what happened. Her lips drew tightly together. We staged a suicide. Surprised me by speaking English. My husband will broke your arm. Why this obsession with me? You show up at my home. You reawaken pain best left dormant. Now you want to destroy my marriage? Why can't you just leave me in peace? I tried a Ryan quick switch. I know about red. What? The Lazarado, the leprosy. Obeline looked as if I who torched your house. Her eyes darkened them at her. Their parents are in pain that never goes dormant. She turned her head, but I forced photos through the crack, keeping them in her field of vision. Her eyes closed, then her shoulders seemed to turtle in on themselves. When she spoke again, her voice carried a tone of defeat. Wait. The door closed. The chain rattled, then the door reopened. Come in. Ryan and I entered a hallway lined on both sides with pictures of saints. Jude, Rose of Lima, Francis of Assisi, a guy with a staff and a dog. Obeline led us past a dining room and library to a parlor with a wide plate. Look, I said. Look at these faces. He reappeared. The pair crossed the room and stood before us. I felt something blue in my chest. The girl stood less than five feet tall. She had pale skin, blue eyes, and thick black hair bobbed at her jawline. It was her smile that snagged and held my gaze. A smile flawed by a single imperfection. Beside me, I felt Ryan go red. The day had taken a radical turn. Hey, Anthony, good to see you, brother. Chapter 37 Dating a girl of about 17, Ryan and I with open curiosity. Are those earrings authentics? 
Real glass, I said, smiling. They're very sparkly. Sparkly? Oh. Would you like them? No way. I removed the earrings and handed them to her. She turned them in her palm, as odd as if they were the crown jewels. Cecile has been living with us for almost three years. Obelie's eyes were steady on mine. Je fais la lessie, Cecile said. Et la menoche. You do laundry and cleaning. That must be a tremendous help. She nodded too vigorously, and I'm really good with plants. I rose. Cecile regarded me. Keeps going fuzzy. It's so funny. She gave the so several O's. Droll? Lolo? Aveline held, held up a finger to say her absence would be brief. Then she and Cecile hurried from the room. Claudine Cloquet, I said, keeping my voice low and steady. Ryan only nodded. His attention was focused on punching his cell. How the hell do you so- Ryan raised a silencing hand. Ryan here, he spoke into the phone. Foster Rock has Cloquet at the residence in El Dier. The Orleans. There was a brief pause. The kid's fine for now, but Master Rock is on the move. Ryan provided a color, model, year, and plate number for the Mercedes. Then can you fix it? She turned to me. Homer. Ryan followed. Together we stood to one side and peeked out a window. The Mirage car was cresting the blacktop, running from Chamin Royale. Was it him? I asked, whispering pointlessly. Right pulled the fanny pack's zip string. Together, we watched the hazy sh uh, shape congeal into a black Mercedes. Sudden realization. We parked at the curb, I hissed. Tabernacle. Ten football fields out, the Mercedes stopped, then abruptly reversed in a ragged u turn Ryan sprinted into the hall through the door, started down the hall and into the dining room. I flipped from her family for his sordid little films. She was twelve, Obeline, twelve years old. That's not how it was. I'm tired of hearing that, I snapped. Cecile is happy with us. Her name is Claudine. She's safe here. She was safe with her family. No, she wasn't. How could you know that? Her father was a monster. Your husband is a monster. Please, her voice was trembling. Come in and sit down. So you can tell me that things aren't what they appear? I was angry. Probably forced her to get naked while peeing on a pink. Behind me, I heard Obelene take a chair at the table. The muffled voices of Homer and Marge Simpson floated from a TV somewhere deep in the house. Finally, I turned back to her. How was your husband acquainted with this man who bought Claudine? My finger hooked quotation marks around the word. He worked for David's father a long time ago, before we married close by the T intersection. Time dragged by and was heading west. Ryan was following, discreetly, hoping Buster Rock would further incriminate himself. He'd be a while. Great. I was careless on Quintsville for God knew how long. Don't know. At that moment, my cell chirped. It was Ryan, Buster Rock, and managed to get onto the 20 curve. Don't go hitting your speed dial, I added. Warning David could end up making you a widow. Rigor stiff, she walked from the room. I dug a pin and notepad from my purse. Then I hooked on my earpiece, laid the cell on the table, and resumed my conversation with Rob. Glad for diversion to pass the time. Shoot, I said. Long or short version. Tell me enough to make me understand. Got the poetry there in front of you? No. Hearing the clatter of cookware, I assumed Obeline had gone to the kitchen not far from where I sat. No big deal. I'll review it. Now, K is code for poems written by your gal back in the 60s, and Q refers to those contained in the Bones to Ashes collection. Known versus questioned, I guess? Yes. Fortunately, for the analysis, as I'll explain, both the K and Q poetry is written in English. Since your friend was a native French speaker, I didn't interrupt. An interesting thing is that even when people try to disguise their language or mimic someone else's, 
A forensic linguist can often see below the surface to areas not under control of the speaker. For example, most people in the United States say stand in line at the post office. In New York, people say they stand online. American speakers, either from New York or elsewhere, don't seem to be aware of this. It's very distinctive, but beneath the level of most people's consciousness. So someone mimicking a New Yorker would have to know that, or a New Yorker disguising his speech would have to be aware of that. Exactly, but typically folks are oblivious to these quirks. Grammatical differences can be even more subtle to say nothing of pronunciation. Rob, we're dealing with written poetry. Written poetry draws on all levels of language. Differences and pronunciation might affect the rhyme scheme. Good point. Going back to words and awareness, ever hear of the devil strip? Ransom note? No. It was the case brought to my mentor, Roger Shue. He looked at the thing, predicted the kidnapper was a well-educated man from Akron. Needless to say, the cops were skeptical. Write this down, it's short, and it'll help you understand what I did with your poems. I scribbled what Rob dictated. Do you ever want to see your precious little girl again? Put $10,000 cash in a diaper bag. Put it in the green trash can on the Devil Strip at Corner 18th and Carlson. Don't bring anybody along. No cops. Come alone. I'll be watching you all the time. Anyone with you? Dill is off. And daughter is dead. One of the first things linguists look for is the underlying language. Is this person a native English speaker? If not, there may be mistaken cognates, words that look like they should mean the same in both languages, but don't. Like, gift in German means poison in English. Embrazada in Spanish. I made that mistake once in Puerto Rico. Instead of saying I was embarrassed, I said I was pregnant. Good one. Systematic misspellings can also show a foreign native language. Notice that in the note that the writer misspelled con and cops for can and cops, but not cash for cash or corner for corner. So it probably wasn't that the writer was educated in a language where the K sound was always spelled K and never you're stuck with me. She wrote patterns that fit and don't hurt can spell. Why doesn't he? To throw the cops off. Maybe in his community, he's known as well-educated. So instead of hiding his education, his attempt at concealing it sends up a flare. But what about Akron? Why not Cleveland or Cincinnati? Read the note again. What words stand out? Double strip. What's your word for the grass strip between the sidewalk and the road? I thought about it. No idea. Most people have a word for it, or if they do, it's a local one. Johnny strip, medium strip. I just saw uh, my thing blink out. Dang it. Where'd the strip go? Devil strip, I guessed. Yes, we already went through that. But no one's aware. Whoever talks about devil strips, you still with me? Yes. So language varies by educational level and geographical region. You can also throw in age, gender, social group, and just about every other demographic feature imaginable. Language demonstrates what group you belong to. You've got it. So, the first thing I tried with your poems was linguistic, demographic, profiling. What does the language tell about the writer? Then I used the microanalytic techniques to discern in each set of poems an individualized language pattern what we call an I, I, dialect. A dialect. Based on all this, I was able to do the authorship analysis you requested and answer the question. Did the same person write both sets of poetry? Did she? Let me go on. This analysis was especially interesting. Since the K poems were composed by a French native speaking person writing in English, as any foreign language teacher knows, you try to speak a second language using the linguistic systems you already know. 
your native tongue. Until you get good, your native language bleeds through into your acquired one. I thought of my own use of French. That's why we have accents and funny sentence structure and word choice. Exactly. So for your analysis, as I worked through all the poems, when I spotted interesting passages, I put them up for the split screen comparison. On one side, I placed the poems as they are. On the other side, I altered the poems to reflect what a French speaker might have been trying to communicate in English. But failing because she was incorrectly translating from French her first language and using false cognates. If the overall coherence of the poem improved due to my changes, I took that as evidence the writer was perhaps Francophone. Do you want me to take you through some examples? How about the bottom line? Well, it's pretty obvious that both the Kate and Kitu poems were written by a native French speaker with limited formal schooling in English. I felt a hum of excitement. Next, I looked for idiosyncratic rhetorical devices common to both the K and Q poetry. And any statistical significance of skewing of vocabulary or grammar. You with me? So far, listen to these lines from the K poem. Late in the morning, I'm walking in sunshine, awake and aware like I have not been before. A warm glow envelops me and towels all around. Now I am love. I can laugh at the universe, for he is all mine. The words rising from my past caused a constriction in my chest. I let Rob go on. Now listen to these lines from the Q poem. Lost in the universe, hiding in shadow, the woman once young looks into the mirror and watches young bones returning to dust. From both the K and Q, the author meters in it. <sighs> Tactilic hexameter. The same device Longfellow used for Evangeline. My friend loved that poem. Tactilic hexameter is common in epic poetry, so in itself, the similar me uh, metering is not particularly meaningful. But of great interest is that throughout these two K and Q samples. Similar mistakes appear consistently, and throughout both, the word universe lacks the final E. Universe, the French spelling. E. Now let's go back to geography. Your friend was Acadian from New Brunswick. She spent time in the South Carolina Low Country. Listen to the title poem from the Q book, Bones to Ashes. What am I listening for? Regional dialect. This Q poem contains mother, mother load. Rob read slowly. Laughing. Three maidens walk carelessly, making their way to the river, hiding behind a great hemlock. One smiles as others pass unknowing. Then with a jump and a cry and a laugh and a hug, the girls put their surprise behind them. The party moves on through the forest primeval. In a bright summer, they think lasts forever, but not the one ailing. She travels alone and glides through the shadows. Others cannot see her. Her hair, the amber of late autumn oak leaves. Eyes, the pale purple of day cream. Mouth, a red cherry. Cheeks, ruby roses. Young bones going to ashes. Same metering, I said. What about vocabulary? You've spent time in New Brunswick and South Carolina, correct? The phrase Forest from Evil is straight out of Longfellow and refers to Acadia, at least in Evangeline. What else? I looked at my jottings. Day clean is a good term for dawn. In the South, ailing is a colloquial for being ill. Exactly. So these two together point to South Carolina. A poet with uh, ties to Acadia and South Carolina a poet influenced by Longfellow's Evangeline. A francophone writing in English. Talk about a linguistic fingerprint. Sweet Jesus, Herod was right. Bones flashes was written by Evangeline. A flash of fire of anger steered through my brain. Another lie, or at best an evasion. I couldn't wait to confront Obeline. Rob spoke again. His words sent ice rolling through my veins. Chapter 
for 38. Wait! I spoke when my lips could again form words back up. Okay. I said that the speaker's mother tongue often comes to the fore when he or she is under stress. Then you're more likely to use false cognates because emotion is boiling through your native language. It may happen in these lines because of the terrible feelings of viewers, because of the unimaginable, unimaginable yet real images on TV of burning victims leaping to their deaths. Read the lines again. It wasn't possible. Rob couldn't have said what I thought I'd heard. Rob had repeated what he'd read. I see the terror that comes from hate. Two towers fall while men debate. Oh, where is God? Even brave people. Chair, bust by fire, jet to death. My heart was banging so hard I feared the sound would carry across the line. Rob continued talking, oblivious to the emotions raging inside me. Chair, blessed by fire, isn't very coherent in English, but the medium is poetry, and in poetry the flow of information and the frames of reference elicited are expected to be murky, and different than in everyday speech. Except in these lines, it is almost everyday speech. At least in French, chair fit. So if the barbate advocating a motorhome holiday, Obelin had lied about Evangeline dying in 1972. Why? Was she truly mistaken? Of course not. She had the poems. She must have known it approximately when they were written. I remember a giggle augured into my musings. I looked up. The room was empty, but a shadow crossed the floor at the doorway. Cecile, I called out softly. Can you tell where I am? I think, I paused as if unsure. You're in the closet. Nope. She hopped into the doorway. Where's the bling? Cooking something. You're bilingual, aren't you, sweetie? She looked confused. You speak both French and English? What does that mean? I took another tack. Can we chat just you and me? We. Oui. She joined me at the table. You like word games, don't you? She nodded. How does it work? Say a word that describes things and I'll make it round. Gross, I said, air puffing my cheeks. She stirred up her face. You can't do that one. Why not? Just can't. Explain it to me. Words make pictures inside my head. She stopped, frustrated with her inability to clarify, or with my inability to understand. Go on, I encouraged. Some words look flat, and some words look crooked. Scratching her eyes, she demonstrated, flat and crooked with her hands. Flat words you can make round by adding O to the end. I like those. You can't do that with crookedy words. Clear as a peat log. I thought about my initial exchange with Claudine. The girl spoke a jumbled franglaise seemingly unaware of the boundaries between French and English. I wondered what conceptual framework divided flat from crookedy words. Sparkly and droll were obviously flat. Gross was crookedy. Fat. I tried my initial word in English. The green eyes sparkled. fat -o. Happy. She shook her head. Fort. No, that one's crookedy too. Fierce, I said baring my teeth and curling my fingers in a mock monster threat. Fierce O, oh, giggling, she mimicked my fierceness. Whatever semantic ordering her mind had created would remain forever a mystery to me. After a few more exchanges, I changed topics. Are you happy here, Cecile? I guess. She tucked her hair behind her ears, smiled. But I like the other place, too. It has big birds on poles. The house in Tracadie. She'd probably been there when Harry and I dropped in. Can you remember where you were before you lived with Obeline? The smile collapsed. Does thinking about the place make you sad? I don't think about it. Can you describe it? She shook her head. Was someone mean to you? Claudine's sneaker made tiny squeaks as her knee jittered up and down. Was it a man? He made me take off my clothes and 
the tutoring intensified. Do you think he was bad? Bad. Do you remember the man's name? Malo? He was bad. It wasn't my fault. Of course it wasn't. But he gave me something cool. I kept it. Want to see? Perhaps later. Ignoring my reply, Claudine shot from the room. In seconds, she was back, carrying a woven leather circle decorated with feathers and beads. It's magic. If you hang it over your bed, you're sure to have good dreams. And why are you harassing Cecile? Claudine and I both turned at the sound of Obeline's voice. We're having a chat, Claudine said. There are apples on the counter. Obeline never shifted her scalp from the face. If you peel them, we can make a pie. Okay. Twirling her dream catcher, Claudine slipped past Obeline and disappeared. A moment's the sound of singing drifted down the hall. Bendez la bois, chauffez la four, ramez la belle, il n'est point jour. I translated the child's tune in my head. Drop the wood, heat the oven, sleep, pretty one. It's not daytime yet. How dare you, Obeline hissed. No, Obeline, how dare you? She has the mind of an eight-year-old child. Fine, Fort and Lisa joined the some of them as 3001. Her eyes started past me to the window. I know about O'Connor House. I'm tracking the purchase order. I'll bet Virginia LeBlanc will turn out to be you or Evangeline. You stole from me? She spoke without bringing her eyes back to mine. I hate to break it to you, but what you and your husband have done is infinitely worse than pinching a book. You misjudge us and make hurtful accusations that aren't true. What happened to Evangeline? This is none of your business. Was that the reason? Business? What the hell? The kid works for daddy. It's not in the job description, but I'll strip her, tie her with ropes, and take a few shots. She's young and poor. Needs the work. She won't rat me out. That's not how it was. I slapped the table so hard, Opaline flinched. Then tell me, how was it? She spun to face me. It was my father-in-law's business manager. Tears wet the gnarled flesh. He forced Evangeline to do it. Mr. Evil No Name, I wasn't buying it. If there was such a person, Obeline had to know who he was. Well, on that note, boys and girls, we're going to take a pause. A pause for the cause, though. If you need something to eat or drink or you need to stretch your legs, um, feel free to. We have about uh, 20 minutes, I would say 18 minutes and some change. So on this break, we have the lovely and talented Miss Mia Savage. She's going to be singing Your Skeleton, Our New Reality, Lemurian Crypto, and Let Me Be Your Home. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this music break.
is to
I think that's low enough. That should work. Welcome back, Weapon Crew. Thanks so much for hanging out with me on the St. Patty's Day. For me, it's been, I don't know, pretty uneventful. But yeah, the kids are being good. The dogs are getting along, so everything's grand. Yes, and diddly do. So back to our book by Kathy Reich, Bones to Ashes. And um, this young lady is actually the person that inspired Bones, the miniseries. So if you haven't seen it, check it out. It's pretty good. David fired him the day of his father's death. I only found out about the pictures later. What happened to Evangeline? I'd keep hammering the question as long as I had to. She stared at me, lips trembling. What happened to Evangeline? Why can't you leave well enough alone? Well enough? Who's well enough? Evangeline? Please. What happened to Evangeline? A sob rose from her throat. Did your husband kill her? Don't be crazy. Why do you say this? One of his henchmen? David would never let anyone hurt her. He loves her. Obline's hand flew to her mouth. Her eyes widened in horror. She just gave away the secret. As before, I felt a coldness spread through me. She's alive? I said quietly. No. Desperate. David loves her memory, her poetry. My sister was a beautiful person. Where is she? Baru, leave her alone. I'm the bully. You will only cause her pain. You will only hurt her. Is she with this man? I remember Obelene's word from words from earlier. How she put it, David and this man needed each other. She won't want to see you. He's hiding her, isn't he? Pour la mort de bon Dieu. What? Did hubby swap your sister for Claudine? Needed a newer model? Obeline's face tightened into a mask of fury. When she answered, her voice had gone harder than mine. Je vais t'acheter la gorgotan. I'll pull out your windpipe. He locked glares, but I looked away first. Was I feeling a touch of uncertainty? A motor sound drifted in from outside and grew louder, stopped. Shortly, the front door opened, closed, footsteps ticked up the hall. Then Ryan strode into the dining room. Ready to roll? Definitely. If my vehemence surprised you, Ryan, he didn't let on. What about Claudine? I asked, skipping my notes and f <laughs> this Obeline. Don't stop until I find your sister, and I'll do everything I can to see that your husband is prosecuted for kidnapping, child exploitation, child endangerment, and anything else we can think of to pin to this sorry ass. Obeline spoke softly and with an air of sadness. I know you want to do good, Tim, but you will cause harm instead. You will harm the people you are trying to protect and those who have helped them. Poor Cecile finds happiness here. Social services will be a nightmare for her, and if you find Evangeline, that will cause her pain. May God bless you and forgive you. The quiet force of Obeline's words pushed away my anger. I was pleading now. Please, Obeline, please tell me what I must know to bring the man who hurt Evangeline and Cecile to justice. Please do this. I can say no more. Obelene murmured, not raising her gaze to mine. Chapter 39 As we sped across Al de Orleans, I recounted my conversation with Claudine and Obelene. Double barreled ambush, Ryan sounded impressed. Your husband's a smut bandit. Your sister did bondage. Obelene claims David is innocent of all the things of which I suspect him, and in fact, Helped some of the girls. Remember her conversation with Kelly Sicard? Where does she lay the blame? On a former employee of her father-in-law? Who? She didn't know or wouldn't reveal his name. Says David fired him in 1980. The fact is that someone murdered several girls, and the only link we have is Boss Rock. I can't ignore that. Ryan veered onto an entrance ramp. There was a short descent, a declaration. Then the Impala lunged forward, and we were on the 20. 
I fell silent, allowing Ryan to focus on driving. As we ate up asphalt, my thoughts meandered through the events of the past 24 hours. David Bosterock, Kelly Sicard, Claudine Cloquette, the sodden and bloated body that was Claire Bredou. Carrie, it was now Wednesday. I hadn't seen her since Sunday night. Hadn't heard from her since she called my mobile Monday morning. One image fragment bumper rode the tail of another. Evangeline in ropes, a girl on a bench. Claudine, a walking tragedy. The mixed race teenager dragged from Lac de Dumontard. Might Evangeline still be working in the porn industry? Might that be the secret that Opaline was hiding? Sound bites replayed over and over, Sicard discussing the anonymous Pierre. I wore moccasins while a guy in a loincloth fucked me. Bostrock's troubling comment. I was barely out of high school when this kid was playing Indian Princess. I felt another shoulder tap from my ID. Or id. So is it id? And I'm just like not pronouncing it correctly? Because I thought it was idea earlier, but I think it is id. Bostarok knew the Bench Girl video had some years on it. The filming had been done in his house. The guy had to be dirty. Or did he? How old had he been then? What was his role in Boston Rock's family business? The tapping continued, insistent. The human brain is, well, mind-blowing. Chemicals, electricity, fluid, cytoplasm, wired up, right, and the thing works. No one really knows how. But the brain's parts can be like governmental agencies, closing ranks to hoard their special knowledge. Cerebrum, cerebellum, frontal lobe, motor cortex. Sometimes it takes a catalyst to get them to share. My neurons had ingested, but not fully digested, a larder full of data in the last few days. Suddenly something shifted. My lower brain contacted my upper. Why? Claudine Cloquette's dream catcher? What if Obelina is telling the truth? I asked, sitting up straight. What if our perv is? the guy who worked at Bostarok's father's place. Right? When Harry and I were in Tracadie, Obeline mentioned a former employee of her father-in-law, said her husband fired him, and the parting wasn't amicable. Ryan didn't comment. This former employee designed the sweat house that was later converted to a gazebo. He was nuts into native art, carved benches, totem poles. I paused for effect. Kelly Sicard said Pierre forced her to wear moccasins. What was Bostarok's remark when he showed him the print of the girl on the bench? The kid was playing Indian princess. Ryan was with me. There was nothing in the picture to suggest a Native American theme when the videos Sicard listed. Think about the titles. Wampum. Wiki up. Son of a bitch. Claudine had a dream catcher. Said she got it from the man she lived with before Obeline. What if Cormier's agent friend Pierre is the same guy Bostarok fired? I'm not sure.